I don't use the BS or the MS. And I think everybody knows what BS is anyway, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and MS is just more of that. You ever have so many questions and no one to ask so they're just wasting away on google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so we had that same problem and that's why we created the rd to be podcast a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have we are students macy and emily and registered dietitian carl barnes we engage in conversations and learn from rds join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country You're listening to another week of the RD to V podcast. I'm your registered dietitian host, Carl Barnes. Uh, this is every week we sit down with a registered dietitian from various backgrounds to highlight the diversity of experience in the dietetics field and just really show students the, the vast opportunities and, and uh, career paths that, that exist. So today um, we're joined by one of my past professors, one of my first mentors, a uh, fantastic experienced dietitian out in San Diego. Um, before I pass it off to, to Dr. Mark Kern, I'll uh, let Emily and Macy introduce themselves real quick. Hi, my name is Emily Hillig. I am a junior dietetic major at the University of Maryland. And I'm Macy. Um, I'm a junior at the University of Maryland as well. I'm just gonna start off by asking how and why did you become a sports dietitian? Well, uh, it started when I was very young in uh, middle school and high school. I was always interested in trying to be the best athlete I could be. And I would use uh, nutrition to try to get an advantage over everybody else. I would do crazy stuff. Like um, the first book I read was uh, from one of Joe Weider's books. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's uh, an old time famous bodybuilder coach kind of guy. He, he had the magazine Muscle and Fitness and sponsored a lot of bodybuilding competitions and so forth. So they had some books out and um, I read one where it said that it was best to eat protein four hours before you work out. And um, I, when I was a freshman, I had weight training class at 9 a.m. Um, or maybe it was 8 a.m. So I would wake up at 4 a.m. and uh, drink a protein shake and go back to bed and then uh, go to school and work out. So I was doing crazy stuff like that. I was um, buying salads at the salad bar and taking my own tuna, things like that. And so I just maintained an interest and I read popular sports nutrition books as a kid. And then when I went to college, I had no idea that you could actually study nutrition. And, and I, on my way to register, I found out you could register for nutrition classes. So I did. That's really awesome. That's like so crazy to wake up at 4 a.m. to drink a protein <laughs> cake, to go back to bed. And like how you had that in your mind, like in high school. I know that I didn't know dietetics was a major until my freshman yeah. year. I'm like, oh, I, I like this. I'm still the same way. Right now, I, I just got done with the bike ride. And so mm -hmm. I'm still sweating from it. And um, so I'm always looking for advantages. Before each of my bike rides, I'm, I'm getting old now. So I'm always in pain. I'm trying this uh, collagen approach. Um, so I put um, um, gelatin. That's the cheapest source of collagen out there. I put a packet of gelatin store brand, I go really cheap, in about half a cup of orange juice about an hour before I exercise. So I still try to incorporate these kinds of things to try to get as much benefit as I can. And, and I'm, I sweat a lot because of it. <laughs> Sorry about that. And no problem. So I noticed that like when I was going through like your CV and stuff that you have an undergraduate master's and a PhD PhD mm -hmm. degree in nutritional science. So how do you think that has helped you with like your overall goals and what you wanted to do? Well, I didn't know what I was exactly going to do when I was in school. So I, I didn't even know there was this nutrition field until I was driving down my freshman year to register for classes. You had to do it in person back then. There was no internet. 
So um, I signed up for classes that would fit either a physics major or a nutritional sciences major. There were two options at the school I went to. There was dietetics and there was nutrition science. And so I went through the courses and I decided on my own, oh, well, I'll get a better job if I do nutrition science because it had higher level science and so forth. These students doing the dietetics, we're gonna do a little less science and some more um, management classes. And so I was convinced that I would be the one that would be making all the money after I graduated. And then I did not go to any of the advising sessions for any of the dietetics curriculum. And there were only two of us that were majoring in nutrition science. There was no internet to get information from or anything like that. So I, I really was clueless until my senior year I started hearing people talk about their internships. And I said, uh, what is an internship? And they're like, oh, you're a nutrition science major. We're going to get jobs. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, we're going to become dietitians after we do an internship. I had no clue till I, I was a senior. I was very shy, so I didn't have um, friendships with my classmates or anything. I, all my friends were the people I lived with and stuff like that. So um, I'm, I was shocked. And so I was like, well, I'll try to get a job without being an RD. There was no way that that was gonna happen. So I decided I had to do a master's degree. So it wasn't that I chose to do a master's degree. I couldn't get a job without one. So I did a master's degree, assuming that a master's degree will lead to a job, but that doesn't happen either in nutrition. So um, I sent out um, not um, job, um, I, I, I applied to jobs, got rejected and decided, okay, I need to do a PhD. And so finally during my PhD, I wised up and I took all those management classes that I should have been taking when I was an undergraduate. And I did all the requirements to complete my DPD during my PhD. So I didn't go into to it with the goal of having a nutrition master's, um, you know, bachelor's, PhD, bachelor's, MS, PhD. I just happened to do it a long way. But what I was doing, instead of taking the um, management classes through all of those programs, was taking exercise science classes. So the whole time I was learning exercise physiology, exercise prescription, all sorts of exercise science. And um, so I came out pretty well-rounded. And then during my PhD, I did what was called an interdepartmental PhD. So I blended it between foods and nutrition, which was the home department for this inter interdisciplinary program, and health kinesiology and leisure studies, which included exercise physiology in it. And so, um, so eventually, I had this interdisciplinary PhD and the bachelor's, master's, and the DPD all done. And then I was employable eventually. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I went about getting all those degrees. And they are very helpful. And all those electives that I did along the way and the DPD that I did along the way were extremely helpful. That's a lot of letters at the end of your name. <laughs> I don't use the BS or the MS. And I think everybody knows what BS is anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and MS is just more of that. And then PhD is just piled higher and deeper. So yeah. So I don't, I'm, I'm not a big fan of using all the letters. Mm -hmm. the, the letters that um, I particularly like to use are the RD. Yeah. I also have the CSD at the end too. I, I use the RD instead of the RDN because I'm an old dude. <laughs> If you could go back, would you change to a more sports specific program or, or would it be not as beneficial as what you have right now? It would have probably not been any more beneficial. My um, PhD was actually, the thesis I did was more of an exercise science thesis instead of a nutrition one. It was a study that was um, a two year exercise intervention to find out how exercise influences bone health of uh, adult women. And so we had them in a two-year strength training and rope jumping program. And um, we measured dietary variables and um, 
uh, and we measured nutritional status in the blood and so forth, but, but it was more of an exercise intervention. So I don't think even if I had done a, uh, an exercise specific program, I would have gotten any more education. The classes, I wouldn't have had any more extensive classes and I wouldn't have done any more extensive exercise research. So I came out pretty much the same as an exercise scientist would, I think, overall. So how do you keep engaged and like up to date with sports nutrition? Uh, I read journals. So I, I get five print journals. So I try to keep up that way. Um, I, the journal that is most specific to that that I get is the International Journal of Sport Nutrition and Exercise Metabolism. So that one, every article is going to be appropriate. Um, but I also get, of course, the Academy's Journal. Uh, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition is one of my favorite. There's not a lot of sports in that. The Journal of Nutrition. And there's one other one. Oh, Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. So that's from the American College of Sports Medicine. So there's some sports nutrition in that too. So, so that's one way. Um, we all get these uh, emails these days with latest research. So um, it's easy to, to follow up on those when those seem interesting. I, I do a lot of conferences. So um, most recently I was um, at the virtual SCAN conference, SCAN symposium, but um, I do a lot of different conferences. That helps. Um, for a while, I was listening to a sports nutrition pod podcast, but I kind of got tired of that. Um, and those are the main ways, I think. Um, and then just through teaching, I know that um, when, I, when I'm teaching a, my sports nutrition class every other semester, there's always new discoveries. So when I'm updating my lectures, I always go to the latest research so I can make sure I include that in my lectures. So that keeps me up to date a lot. So what does your typical day look like and how has your typical day changed throughout the years? Well, the typical day these days with uh, the pandemic, it's definitely atypical. Um, I like to um, exercise a lot. I like to live the sports nutrition lifestyle. So I wake up super early, like ridiculously early because my kids have to go to school at like eight and I like to exercise for a couple hours before that. When it's not the pandemic, I go to the YMCA and um, spend a couple hours there. But um, during the pandemic lately, I've been exercising in my garage, riding my bike for a couple hours. And so then um, I get the kids to school. Then I Sometimes before I get on the bike or sometimes during the bike, I catch up on emails. I'm able to do that on the trainer, so that's helpful. Um, then after I get the kids to school, I do more catching up with emails and that type of thing. Then the rest of the day is usually not typical from day to day at all. So some days I have teaching and then I have to brush up on whatever the topic is that I'm gonna be teaching. Um, other days, I have grants that are coming due and I have to write grants. Um, um, some days I have to edit articles, so articles that we're writing or that I am editing as part of Pulse, which is the um, publication of, of SCAN, which SCAN is going to be no more and Pulse is not going to be around anymore. So that's going to free up some time for me. And that's kind of the majority of the things. Oh, and I didn't mention that we're in the lab a lot too. So we're in the lab doing research, testing subjects. Um, there's one particular test that I'm the only one on campus that can do. So anytime we have those subjects, I'm the one that has to run that test. And then I'm also the go-to phlebotomist when anybody has trouble with the blood draw. So, so they call on me for for doing a lot of blood collections. So how much time do you devote to research and what current research are you doing? And how did you first get into research after becoming a dietitian? Uh, so I would say that 
at least half my time is doing something related to research, whether it's catching up on the literature or writing a grant proposal or actually being in the lab doing um, the data collection. Or we've been spending a lot of time trying to fix the labs. We, we had a building that was shut down for about a year and a half and um, with lots of problems. So we, we've had to do a lot of work on, on those kinds of things. Um, but I spent at least half my time in the labs. Uh, how did I get started in research? That started during the PhD. So I, during my master's degree, I d designed a study and got IRB approval. And then I was ready to graduate before we collected the data. And so um, I was able to do a non-thesis master's and then get right into my PhD, which um, did require the thesis. So that, that's when I started doing research um, more specifically. And the person that um, I worked with is um, one of the most famous nutritionists in all of the land. Her name is Connie Weaver at Purdue University. And um, she knew that I had an interest in exercise. So she recruited me to help with her um, study, the two-year study. They already had the approval and they were just getting it started. And my main job was to supervise the exercise routine, um, uh, organize the testing and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I did a lot of that um, right from the get-go. We did a lot of other projects while I was there too. So um, I was involved in, in other projects that other people were doing while I was doing my own. That's what where it all started. And then when you work in academia, that's an expectation. So I, I, you had to keep going, which I wanted to do. So, so I still do it. I don't have to anymore, but, but I can pay myself extra if I do research. So I do. And I like it. So. so what kind of research are you involved in right now? Oh, yeah. Right now, we have several studies going on. Um, in sports nutrition, we have two projects that are really closely related. One um, is a study to find out if pistachios can improve recovery from um, ex uh, strenuous exercise. We're using downhill running as the strenuous exercise. So uh, people do a downhill run, and then for the next four days, they eat either no pistachios, um, uh, one and a half ounces of pistachios, or three ounces of pistachios a day, starting with immediately after that downhill run. And the, our idea is that they'll recover faster if they have pistachios because they're rich in leucine, relative to other nuts at least, maybe not as rich in leucine as milk or beef or something like that, but they're still relatively rich in leucine. And our idea is that the higher dose of pistachios will provide even more leucine, which may improve recovery. And they are rich in antioxidants. So uh, we patterned the study after a project where they did an antioxidant supplementation and they found improvements in recovery after a downhill run with just antioxidant supplementation. And since pistachios are rich in both antioxidants and leucine, we figure there's a good chance that, that they'll help with recovery since antioxidant supplements were able to do the same kind of thing. Uh, the other sports nutrition project right now is um, feeding people almonds for an eight week period. And at the end of the eight week period, they do a downhill run and we do those same kinds of tests. The idea behind the almonds that got us started is they were interested in funding research to find out if eating an almond snack versus a more common uh, refined type of snack, we're using pretzels as the refined snack, if it might promote uh, people's behavior to be more active. That was what they were interested in, just if you, snack on almonds, does that change your behavior to try to take better care of yourself and be more active? And maybe through um, like a reduced insulin response, you feel more energetic and you're able to go about your daily life with more vigor. So we're testing that over the eight week period and then we're testing the same response to downhill running with the, with the almonds. 
Then we're doing research with um, prunes. We've been doing prune research for many years. This particular one is a one-year intervention in um, mostly college-aged women who are either using oral contraceptives or not. Oral contraceptives may put the bone at risk for bone loss, and prunes have been shown to um, promote bone gain, so or at least reduce bone loss. So our idea is that if the oral contraceptives over that one-year period are going to going to cause some bone loss, that the prunes will, will blunt that effect. Um, in that same project, we're also doing a one month study to find out throughout the menstrual cycle what's happening to um, uh, the um, hormones uh, that fluctuate throughout the um, menstrual cycle. Surprisingly, there's almost no studies that do like sequential tests of what happens to, um, to estrogen and progesterone and so forth during a menstrual cycle. And so we're going to find that out in women that both are using oral contraceptives and those that are not. So um, that's kind of a cool thing that's not a nutrition project, but it fits right in with what we're doing and it's easy to, to tag it on and we're going to answer some questions about that. We're doing a study in older um, individuals. Yeah, we're doing a lot of projects, sorry. Uh, where we're feeding them strawberries. Uh, we, we are using freeze-dried strawberries to keep it under control compared to a powder that um, tastes and looks like freeze-dried strawberries that they mix in water, they drink it down. And um, over, I think it's an eight week period on that too, we're measuring cardiometabolic risk factors as well as cognition to see if strawberries can improve those in older individuals. And we're just wrapping up a study where we fed people yogurt for a month to see if it changes their breath, um, hydrogen and methane uh, uh, losses uh, as an indicator of what might be going on in the GI tract with um, yogurt consumption as a source of probiotics. The idea is that if, um, if you change the uh, microbes in your colon, then it, it may shift them from those that uh, cause the production of hydrogen to those that produce methane or vice versa. And you can detect that at the level of the lungs because it dissolves into the circulation. And then you breathe some methane and some hydrogen off and we have equipment that can can measure that kind of stuff. So, so that's about it. That's enough of the, the studies. We've got others going on, but those are the key ones. That's really interesting. So who are PhD students working on the research, master's students, who we, like makes up your team? We only go up to a master's degree, although we're trying to get permission to start a PhD at some point. Um, so, it's mostly master's students. There's definitely undergraduate students involved too. And um, I also have a study coordinator for the pistachio study and he helps out with some of the other projects as well. So as a I'm professor- a graduate of our program. Oh, I'm sorry. As a professor, do you encourage your students to partake in research? Yeah, definitely the master's students for sure. And then there's, a, we have a pretty large program, so there's no way that all of our undergraduate students could get involved. But then those who have really shown an interest, we definitely like to get them involved too. So how do you encourage these students to become involved in research? Uh, the, there's a couple ways. So we have units, that um, credit hours that students can take for what are called special studies. And so they can get involved with the professor. Um, maybe it's in the lab, maybe it's not even in the lab and they're making brochures or something like that. But for me, it's usually people who come in the lab and they just, in the exchange for their time and effort, they get um, units and they get experience in conducting research. Sometimes I start them off as research subjects if um, they, they don't know much about the study or anything like that so that they can get tested and they can learn all of the techniques by going through it. And um, I think it's really important for everyone to 
go through the same test that they are going to conduct on other people so they know exactly what the research subjects are going through and everything. I still only allow them to do it on a voluntary basis. I don't say you have to do this or anything like that. That would be against IRB protocols, but it's an extremely good experience for them. I do the same thing to myself all the time. Sometimes I, I've even put myself at, um, at risk by being the first guinea pig in a research subject. My students usually get to hear some scary stories. A good way to recruit people if they're interested. <laughs> Yeah. So I also noticed that you're a part of like a lot of professional organizations. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that this has further and enhanced your knowledge or your understanding of these topics? Well, for most of those, I attend conferences that they're involved with. Sometimes um, they're the virtual ones lately, or sometimes you, I catch a webinar or something like that that, that they put out. Um, so that is definitely a key way. Um, the most important societies that I'm part of are the um, Academy and the American Society for Nutrition. Um, so the American Society for Nutrition is more science-based, more um, not that the Academy doesn't use evidence in guiding their decisions and everything, but it's more of a practice organization versus a scientific organization, whereas the uh, American Society for Nutrition is more about research and so forth. They do work beyond research, but that's kind of the main goal of them and the, the members. So it's a good compliment to be part of both of those. Um, I'm also part of the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, I don't put as much time into that as I do the other two. And then of course, as part of the Academy, I'm, I'm a member of um, several DPGs. And I think the DPGs are a really good way to understand the part of the um, dietetics field that you're particularly, particularly interested in. So um, like SCAN is now splitting into a sports nutrition specific practice group and a cardiovascular and wellness practice group. So if you're interested in those, it's a good idea to join those DPGs. I'm also a member of the research DPG and the weight maintenance DPG. I think that's it. That's interesting. So how do you think that um, being um, like in the presence of these professional organizations, like how do you think that could benefit or help students? Well, there's definitely networking opportunities. Carl, I think, is a great example of that. He got involved with the Academy um, either his senior year or just after his senior year. I'm not really sure. And um, I think all those networking opportunities that he took advantage of helped him to be where he is today. Um, so that's good. But then you're also exposed to this, the materials that the professionals are exposed to. So you're getting the same benefits as a student member that they are getting as a as a professional member. So um, those are the two main things, I think. When you're going online um, and researching through these journals, how do you know, like, what are the key things you look for that make it a, a good research, um, you know, article? Yeah, that's a tricky thing these days. There's so many predatory journals out there. It, one thing that I look at is if it's only available as a, an open access journal, then I really start scrutinizing it. There are definitely some decent open access only journals, but, um, but it seems like it's more of a, an exception than a rule that they're high quality. I've got a particular problem with one that a lot of people are big fans of, but it's a journal that um, it has a high impact factor. If you've ever looked at ways that they measure quality of journals, impact factor has to do with how many times their journal articles are cited on average. So um, an impact factor of like three means that um, each article on average is, is cited three times in a given year. So, um, so there are ways that they can inflate that, like the editors can, um, uh, suggest that uh, the authors 
add a citation that happens to be a citation from their journal and then they get more citations that way and it pumps up the impact factor. Uh, this particular journal that I'm not a fan of that's in the nutrition field um, also um, has a, uh, won't um, uh, allow people to know what their acceptance rate is. So usually journals are really proud when they can say that we have an acceptance rate of 25% of the articles that are submitted or something like that. This journal will not disclose that. So that probably means that they have a very high acceptance rate and it's probably close to 100%. Another thing that goes along with that is that the authors have to pay for publication. And so you put all the work into doing the work and to doing the research, then you have to pay to publish it. There's always been some journals out there that have what they called page charges, but they were usually pretty nominal, not, not an extremely expensive journal to publish in. But nowadays, there's a lot of journals that are expensive to publish in, but if you submit it to them and you give them that check, you're almost assured that you're gonna get published in it. So kind of scrutinizing and looking at that is important. There's a, a list that's online called Beals List, I believe that um, is a list of journals that this Beals person, or maybe a group of people, I'm not sure, have decided are not um, well-respected journals. So that's a good way to look and find out if that's a bad journal to be looking into. Then beyond that, even if it is published in a good journal, you have to really um, scrutinize the study and make sure that the authors are interpreting the results within the limitations of their study design. And sometimes they don't do that. I've seen even seen that in the Academy's journal. Um, every publication has to get through reviewers, but the reviewers sometimes are too busy or maybe they're not particular experts on that particular field that they decided that they thought they would be. So, you know, sometimes you get an easier reviewer and sometimes you get a, a more rigorous reviewer. I like to get the rigorous ones who give really clear guidance when, when they give you feedback and then you can improve your journals, journal articles that way. But there's, there's a lot of journals out there that don't do that and some articles get through very easily. So you, you have to scrutinize a lot, I guess is my final answer. <laughs> so, I know that some people are really interested in research and things like that. Were you a strong writer before you started doing research articles or like, how did you? I, I thought I was, but when I was um, an undergrad in my writing class, I got a B, but I did see, I think it was a B plus, but I did see the instructor on campus the next semester because I, I told her, oh, I thought I deserved a, an A minus. And, um, and she said, no, sorry. But I saw her on campus the next semester and she said, Mark, I've really been thinking about your grade and I do think you deserved an A minus. I'm sorry, I gave you a B plus. So maybe I'm an A minus kind of writer, but I have gotten a lot better over the years. There's just things that you learn to look for and you start thinking about the way the words, what the words mean and how to make them mean the most important thing. And the more, to, more I edit the papers that my students write, the better I get and more quickly I can do it every time. So, plus I've been the editor in chief of Scans Pulse for the last 17 years. So that helps a lot. My role with Pulse is mostly in content editing, making sure people get the science right. Uh, and then I have another person who helps with all of the word choice and grammar and punctuation and everything. But I make sure that I follow all of her edits and make sure I incorporate them into my writing too. So that when I send her stuff that I've written myself, she sends me back as minimal edits as possible so that I'm not embarrassed. That's a good person to have in your pocket. Oh yeah. So I'm going to follow up a little bit from what you said before. Um, how specifically can undergraduate students get involved in research opportunities? How, how can they specifically? Process? Yeah, is it a selective process? So um, 
there a lot of times it's people that have been in my class and they said, oh, I'm interested in what you're doing. Is there something that I can do to be involved? Part of it is also because we have these uh, elective units, these special studies units, they know that they can come to us and, and potentially get a unit out of the way or up to three units. And so they just are looking for a way to, to get um, units by doing work rather than taking exams and so forth. So a lot of them come to us. Uh, we don't have to go out and recruit a lot. We get a lot of people that want to help us out. So that, that happens a lot. And our advising office sends people to, to the faculty a lot, sends a lot of students to the faculty. All right, thank you. Um, what was the most beneficial advice, opportunity, experience, a research resource you had during your undergraduate experience? Uh, during my undergrad, I had a, an amazing professor. His name was Nathan Shire. And um, he gave me extremely good advice, but I haven't always been very good at following it. And if I had followed it all along, I'd probably be way more successful. But he said, don't burn any bridges. And you hear that all the time. That's not um, he's not the only person that's ever said that, but he said in the nutrition field, it's a small world. And if you burn bridges, then it's going to come back, back to haunt you. And I have burned a few over the years, but um, usually they haven't come back to haunt me too bad. So, um, so I'm getting by okay. I try not to burn any more than I have to. That's very sage advice. Yeah. So, so we've got questions that were texted in from students. We do try and do this for most of these where students can text in at 202-918-3818. So we've got two questions from students for you here as we wrap up. So Olivia asks, what do you think about the mind-gut connection? The mind-gut connection. So uh, we are doing, like I mentioned, we did the, we're doing the study with yogurt and I'm um, trying to change the gut microbiome. We just got a grant. Um, this is a project I didn't tell you about as, as we were going through that because we haven't recruited any subjects for it yet. But uh, we were funded by the USDA to find out if fruit consumption influence, influences the gut microbiome and if that can potentially translate to changes in cognition. And we're doing the same kind of thing with our strawberry study, whether or not the strawberries influence the gut microbiome or they're influencing cognition by it some other way. Um, we're, we're not really sure or anything. But this USDA study, we're going to feed the six most commonly consumed fruits at either um, typical intake of fruits, which is about half a cup a day. I know that's a horrible number to hear, but that's kind of typical versus what the USDA recommends, which is two cups a day of fruits. So we're gonna give them a mixture throughout the week of these six different fruits and um, see how it changes the gut microbiome and then cognition. And it's really hard in these kinds of studies to draw a direct connection between changes in the gut microbiome and cognition, but we'll do some statistical procedures to kind of try to find out if they are indeed connected. But so far, that's really been an elusive thing is finding a true connection between what's going on in the gut and what's happening in the brain. There's other potential connections between the gut and the brain. Uh, we know, for example, uh, taste receptors that we find on our tongue are also found in, throughout our GI tract. And so those are sending some signals to the brain that might be controlling digestive processes or appetite or nobody knows what all those might be controlling. But there's definitely some clear connections between what's going on in the gut and what happens in, in the brain. Um, it's just kind of hard to figure out if what you're doing is directly influencing both by some connection that's hard to establish, if that makes sense. But we think there could be. I'm always fascinated by the, the research you guys are doing and the, the practical nature of it. It's always very intriguing. Cool. So Addie also asked, so with respect to a, a woman trying to promote muscle gain, how much strength training in combination with how much protein should one be looking for to promote muscle gain, muscle growth? Mm -hmm. 
I used to know the numbers better for how much strength training it would take. Um, like the number of reps at what particular intensity. We did a study where we fed people um, either an egg-based breakfast or a bagel-based breakfast um, uh, immediately after they worked out with the idea that an egg-based breakfast would allow the, the strength training to make them bigger and buffer and stronger and so forth. We didn't find any real differences. It didn't matter what, the, what they ate immediately after their workouts. It's probably more important what they eat for the day. You can catch up by, by not necessarily eating uh, super high protein right after your workout or something like that. Most of the studies say it's, it's what you do overall that counts. So for the amount of protein, it's probably making sure you get that 1.2 to 1.8 grams per kilogram um, of protein. For the workout part, it's probably doing around three sets of strength training at um, a high intensity, a uh, high enough intensity that you can do between like six and I think the number was like 12 repetitions, somewhere between like six and 12 seems to be what maximizes turning on muscle protein synthesis. So three sets of those for as many body parts as you have time and energy to do. That's fantastic advice. I never thought I'd be saying eight, eight years ago or so when I was sitting in your class, I had no expectation of sitting for a CSST, but that is, that is on my radar in the, the near future. There you go. So never, never count out, count out your options in the future. For sure. But uh, I appreciate you, you coming and sitting with us. I appreciate your, your guidance and support over the years. Always, always great to see you. My pleasure, A, and, and I stopped sweating. <laughs> A great way to wrap. I recovered from my afternoon bike ride. Awesome. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll catch you on the next one. All right. Have a good one.